All right. Thank you so much, everybody, for tuning in. Uh, thanks for being patient. We're a few minutes uh, behind. Uh, but today, we're going to talk about something a little different. I know a lot uh, of the time on this channel, we're talking about Ethiopia and Eritrea, but we're also talking about a lot of other countries that have dealt with some of the similar uh, neo-colonial imperialist tactics, uh, particularly in the way that uh, media is weaponized, which as you guys know, is something I'm really passionate about. So without further ado, my guest today is Carlos Ron. He is the Deputy Minister of Foreign Affairs for North America uh, for Venezuela, as well as the president of the Simone Bolivar Institute. Carlos, thank you so much for making the time uh, to speak with us. I sort of want to ask you kind of big picture, because we've heard Venezuela in the news for a long time. I remember when I was with uh, Al Jazeera America back in 2013 to 2016, it was in the news a lot that the economy was uh, not doing well, that people were not able to get basic uh, needs, there were protests, etc. So I don't want to color what you're going to say with some of what I've read, but I want you to uh, broadly tell us what Venezuela has been dealing with in terms of uh, fighting back against imperialism. And before you do that, I'm going to play a 20 second clip from Venezuelan President uh, Nicolas Maduro speaking at the UN General Assembly assembly in uh, September of last year. This new world, this new human community, must be free of hegemonic empires. It must be liberated, liberated from any hegemons or any empires' attempts at economic, financial, military, or political domination. So that's something that really um, resonates with a lot of us uh, from the Horn of Africa right now. From the Venezuelan perspective, what does it mean to be in that fight? Well, first of all, thank you very much. I'm really glad to be here with you today. Um, and it's really important for us to, to have this conversation as I think it's something that uh, nowadays affects almost uh, a third of the world. I mean, a third of the world right now is living under unilateral sanctions from the United States. And uh, Venezuela, like, like you uh, mentioned uh, before, and like uh, we saw President Maduro mention, is a country that has been basically building its own its own path uh, it's its own uh, um, independent uh, road towards uh, development um, in but 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 in, in opposition to what the United States had planned for Venezuela uh, in opposition to what the United States um, used to uh, before be able to direct uh, on Venezuela and, and Venezuela's neighbors uh, since 1999 we have you know we drafted a new constitution we won a very uh, important election. President Hugo Chavez was elected as uh, a leader and he convened the population to draft this new constitution and basically reorient uh, the, the, the path of, of the country, a uh, path that today we, we, we are uh, we're thriving towards socialism. And of course, this is something that attempts against uh, the United States uh, uh, design for the region. Therefore, what um, the United States has has started to do against Venezuela since then is basically uh, what we call hybrid war because it's, it's an it's a accumulation of different attempts to undermine Venezuela's democracy and to undermine Venezuela's ability to be able to carry out the policies as, as it should. Um, this, of course, uh, uh, it was exacerbated by uh, the death of President Hugo Chavez and after the election of President Nicolas Maduro, so the exception in Washington that this was the now or never moment because, you know, President Maduro wasn't uh, as popular as President Chavez. He wouldn't have the charisma to, to continue his project. And this would be the opportunity to basically uh, bring Venezuela's socialist project down. Uh, what has happened ever since is that, uh, you know, we, we began to have uh, much more harassment uh, from the United States, much more uh, funding and support for uh, Venezuela's uh, opposition to do unconstitutional attempts at uh, uh, trying to obtain government. 
And then after the Trump administration comes in, this you know scales up a notch uh, by the implementation of these uh, sanctions, as, as they're wrongly called in the United States. We say wrongly called because um, the only sanctions that are legal according to international law are those that are, that are uh, applied by the United Nations Security Council. In this case, there's no sanctions by the UN against Venezuela. This is a decision, a political decision by the United States to to uh, to place these uh, um, these uh, measures on Venezuela, in order to undermine its government, in order to create so much chaos and pain within the population that they would see they, they would seek a way to overthrow the government or or you know to uh, of, of sort of uh, go in a different direction. As of today, for example, uh, just to give you a, a, a general overlook. Venezuela has lost about 99%, and that's not an exaggerated number. This is a real number. 99% of its income in rel in relation to perhaps uh, you know 2013, 2014. Uh, today uh, we are sanctioned in a way that we cannot uh, trade our oil, which is uh, our, our main uh, source of revenue from uh, for our economy. We cannot trade some of our uh, basic minerals like like gold and, and, and others. We have been blocked in transactions uh, in, in, within the U.S. financial system, which, which means that any accounts that Venezuela has within the U.S. banking system has been frozen and we cannot use the, the, the amount of money. This is about $7 billion or so that are in U.S. and, foreign, and other foreign banks that are not, that we are not able to uh, to do anything with and only belonging to the Venezuelan people. Um, we cannot, uh, we can all, we also cannot do things that other countries do when they're in economic trouble. For example, we cannot renegotiate our debts. We cannot issue bonds. We cannot uh, restructure our debts. And it has gotten to the point where the United States aggression has even gone as far as to sanction programs that uh, the, the government has implemented in order to sort of combat this, uh, this aggression. For example, there's a program of food subsidies called CLAP by, because of its initials in Spanish. And basically this is a, a distribution of food items that come in, under a subsidized price to the majority of the Venezuelan population, about 6 million families receive this. Well, that program has also come under sanctions by the U.S., meaning that, you know, anything, anyone that trades, uh, that normally trades uh, with with Venezuela in order to provide these items for, for this program can also be somehow hurt under the U.S. system. So in a way, this is, this is sort of a blockade uh, and a persecution that is going on against Venezuela uh, that is basically uh, hurt, it has hurt our economy for the last uh, uh, several years. And it continues to have a, a strong impact on the majority of the population, despite the fact that you know we struggle every day. The people of Venezuela resist. The government of Venezuela resists in order to find ways to overcome this uh, these difficulties. Yeah, it's it's honestly amazing that the country has stuck in there. Like I said, this has been going on for a long time. The country's been sanctioned for about the last 15 years. You mentioned. Hugo Chavez, who when he passed away in 2011, it was Maduro that he had set up to um, to replace him if, if anything had happened. Um, so uh, oil being Venezuela's huge export, it's, I believe, one of the biggest uh, producers of oil in the entire country, if not the biggest. Um, and even with that, though, the sanctions have a devastating effect. And you said they're not rightly uh Label. They're not. To most Americans, including to myself, not too long ago, you hear sanctions and you just think sort of an economic slap on the wrist, uh, a way to get this other country to be more democratic or mm -hmm. uh, uh, to stop human rights abuses, which are always so uh, broad in terms of um, the way they explain it. So talk a little bit about how sanctions were weaponized and all the different ways that that had an impact on the economy, even with oil, uh, with having as much oil as the country does. Well, you mentioned a very important point is that, you know, people tend to think 
that because these are sanctions and this is in an all right coup d'etat or this is an all right uh, conventional war, this is somehow better or different or kinder or more humane. When in reality, what you're doing, you're subjecting to uh, people to, you know, an actual war economy. Because, see, what, what what people don't realize is that under sanctions, it's not just that you target a specific person. Uh, you know, oh, we were targeting President Nicolas Maduro, so he's going to have his visa revoked, and if he has a bank account, it's going to get frozen. That's sort of the narrative that the State Department sells to people and makes you think that this is all that's going on. In reality. Uh, you know, you have people, uh, you know, the, there's the actual sanctions uh, as they're explicitly uh, drawn out. And there's also uh, the issue of overcompliance where you have companies and banks and, and all these uh, actors within the financial system that don't want to deal with Venezuela or with any sanctioned country because they're afraid of how, uh, you know, these uh, measures would sort of uh, impact them if they, uh, that they are going to get hurt themselves. So I'll give you a, a quick example, uh, but that is very telling during this pandemic, which is precisely the moment that we needed most to have access to, you know, the international markets and to and to have uh, access to supplies to to fight this off. Well, there's um, there are many companies that didn't want to sell supplies to Venezuela and supplies, I mean, you know, masks or test kits and all these things. They wouldn't want to sell these to Venezuela because they thought that uh, the United States was somehow going to have, uh, you know, affect their business elsewhere or, or enact some sort of action against them. And when we, and when we, you finally found some of these companies willing to sell to Venezuela, then they hike up the price to three, four, five times because they know they have this, you know, advantage. And even then, if you try uh, to pay these companies, then you face the other problem that you, you know, your bank transaction might not go through. You know, you send the money and 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 they get it gets frozen somewhere, and, and and so basically, you know, it's it's a very difficult attempt at at you know trying to have normal life, and it's an attempt that you know at, at the end of the day, it's not hurting President Maduro, it's not hurting you know somebody high in the government, it's hurting the whole population, with no discrimination of whether they like or they don't like the president, whether they vote or not for the president. This is, you know, the only democratic thing about about the sanctions is that they hurt everybody you know same way. You know they hurt all of the country the same way, and and this is this is not, and this is a criminal uh, issue. I mean, in the sense that the, you know a country enacting these uh, these actions against another is a violation of you know international law. Articles of the Rome Institute, for example, says you know that calls these you know uh, crimes against humanity because you're in fact uh, enacting a collective punishment on on a generalized population. So this is something that you know that we've been trying to uh, to struggle against for for you know the last several years. Again, like I said, under the Trump administration, they 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 um, they were exacerbated. Under the Biden administration, there has been no change of policy. So a lot of people thought that you know a new policy, a new uh, administration would come in with you know, a different mindset and more progressive and. And, you know, even even some people from the Democratic Party have, you know, issued letters of concern about how these measures are being implemented and how these are affecting people. But at the end of the day, there has been no real uh, ease of, of the sanctions. You know, we were exactly the same way we were on January you know, 19th, uh, uh, the year before. So, you know, uh, it's exactly the same, uh, the same uh, attack and aggression against Venezuela. Yeah, it's so interesting. It doesn't matter the administration. It, it, it sort of looks the same for the most part. Hold on one second. Working from home, my uh, light is working against us. So give me one second, Carlos. Thank you. So um, mm -hmm. another thing I think is really interesting is... Um, the media is such an incredible tool for this because they know that the average American doesn't understand what sanctions actually do. They were never paying attention to Venezuela until they saw it in the headline. They were never really paying attention to Ethiopia uh, until they saw it in a headline. Um, and there's this general acceptance, although I think it's changed that the U.S. is trying to be 
uh, a savior in different countries trying to uh, push for democracy, uh, deter human rights abuses. And it's incredible how still very much um, common uh, approach that or that that thinking actually is. What was what do you think uh, was the tool against Venezuela? Was it will put these sanctions um, in place? It will mess up the economy, and then we'll just talk about how people are literally losing pounds, as a lot of the headlines were saying, taking polls of the average amount of weight the per a person has lost during uh, a really mm -hmm. extreme economic time. What were the headlines, and what was the approach that uh, you guys were pushing back on, and who was pushing back on it? Was it social media? Was it journalists on the ground? Well, there are several dynamics at play here in, in in what you said and first of all like i mentioned before this is a hybrid war so there's a sev there's several different types of attacks but so there's definitely an attack uh that is coming uh by the media uh by the mainstream media in the u.s you know portraying venezuela for, you know first of all they want to they want to minimize the uh the impact of the sanctions by by blaming uh socialism or by blaming you know the the, the venezuela administration for uh, the, econ the economic um, downfall, but you can clearly see, you know, the country's income and and the the sharp drop of income once sanctions sanctions actually get enacted and once uh, the prohibition of oil uh, comes about. So so there's you know there's definitely a, a very a, you know a jump uh, in in the economic situation of the country, uh, you know specifically when when these uh, started and but the media narrative has of course you know uh tried to 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 ma mask uh the effects of u.s policy and basically what they what they've been trying to do and and they say this explicitly what they're trying to do is trying to find uh people that would turn against uh the venezuelan government against president maduro because of their uh lack of simply because of the lack of capability of of you know winning an outright democratic election. Uh, you know, they're, they're hoping, they were always hoping that the military would turn against the president. They sanctioned some um, military leaders, some key military leaders, and, and they would say often, well, you know, these sanctions can be reversed when and if, you know, these leaders decide to turn against Reza Maduro and for, you know, whatever their version of democracy is. Um, and, and then it actually happened. There was, there was, for example, one case. The, the only sanction that has been overturned was of uh, one uh, um, um, man in the military who uh, was head of the intelligence agency, and he uh, joined a coup attempt against President Maduro. And when he did that, after he did that, he fled to the United States. The coup, of course, uh, failed, and the United States lifted uh, the sanction on him. So basically, you know, they're, they're trying to. Uh, use these measures to get people to turn against uh, uh, the government. Now, what, what have we done or what, what have we been able to do uh, to counteract this? Like you said, the role of, um, of social media, the role of alternative media has been, of course, very important given that, you know, still today, uh, the majority of media outlets uh, in Venezuela are, are private owned. But, you know, during the revolution, we started uh, uh, a new you know, a policy where community media outlets were strengthened, where uh, the public sector was also strengthened. So now you have a more balanced uh, of gaining information. And of course, with the explosion of social media elsewhere, and, 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 and basically the, the livelihood of everyone, I mean, everybody's undergoing these uh, measures and can see for themselves, you know, the, the, the true uh, impact that they're having and they don't buy it, you know, they don't buy the, the discourse of, of, of the U.S. They know that these measures are hurting uh, their everyday life. Well, all these elements together kind of are, are you know, help push back against uh, the narrative. But it is, it is very, it is very, um, it has been very difficult to, to fight this off. Again, because the economic situation has not been the best and people have had to make adjustments and some of these adjustments are basically heroic. And, you know, and, and we, we had to struggle uh, onward. And, you know, because of the level of uh, violations of international law that the United States has perpetrated against Venezuela are incredible. 
Uh, just to give you one one example that people uh, uh, maybe won't, you know, uh, it's, it's hard to believe, but, but it's true, is that even in uh, the case of a diplomat in Venezuela, whose name is Alex Saab, and who was uh, uh, part of the, the um, he was a special envoy who was during the pandemic trying to find some of these important supplies for Venezuela. Well, he was basically... Uh, captured in Cape Verde, in, in Cabo Verde, in, and then was uh, 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 taken uh, because, he, you know, we don't call that an extradition because all the processes were violated. He was basically taken to United, to United States, and he's sitting now in a Florida jail cell, despite his diplomatic immunity, despite, like, all the, you know, the what he was doing, uh, just because, you know, they want to get information from him, they want to uh, find out how we are circumventing uh, the sanctions and, and what we're doing. And basically, you know, the United States has been willing to break international law uh, in many ways, only to uh, promote a change of government here in Venezuela. Yeah, it's, uh, it's really incredible. There have been some coup attempts going as far back as uh, under uh, President George W. Bush. Uh, mm -hmm. Going back to sort of some of the way the anxious, uh, sanctions rather have affected the people there, oil being uh, so huge in Venezuela, yet uh, I was looking into some of the impacts of the sanctions. And one of them uh, was that you guys couldn't get the raw material at some mm -hmm. point to dilute the crude oil and to make it um, sellable. And so it's it's such a uh, to your point, and, and I forget his name, but I have uh, read his story, uh, the one who was captured in, um, or arrested rather, in Cape Verde. It's literally, if you try to go outside of the, the sanctions, you will get punished. So even countries that might be sympathetic to you, companies that might be sympathetic to you, they don't want to do business because they don't want to deal with the extra taxes or the legal issues, even though, to your point, the U.N. has to actually convict a country, a leader, somebody of a crime before actually uh, they can be sanctioned. And yet for the last few decades, sanctions have been unilateral and have been used to try to force the hand uh, of people on the ground. In the case of Venezuela, again, I find it a really fascinating example because I think Ethiopia is very young uh, in this effort for the last, the majority of the last 30 years, the government uh, has been very much in bed with the US government. So it really wasn't an issue except for the people. Um, what have, or what is the understanding on the ground from Venezuelans? How is it, and I'm sure, of course, it's not gonna be everybody, there's opposition, how is it that they're able to understand what is happening? Was it because of the influence there in Chavez or is it, what's the history there? Well, something that is that is interesting, and again, part of this aggression of, of the United States that, you know, uh, when you lay it out all together, it seems like, <laughs> like a fairy tale because it's so ludicrous. But, you know, one of the things that the United States did as part of their actions against Venezuela was to promote uh, basically a parallel government. Uh, the U.S. has recognized another man called Juan Guaido as president of Venezuela. This is a man who was part of the National Assembly uh, in 2019, and he basically went to a public square and decided, you know, proclaims himself president, that he was a legitimate authority of the country, and he would therefore, uh, um, you know, uh, basically uh, uh, be the one uh, that the United States would deal with. Uh, and, and recognize. Now, the effects of, of, of this uh, are, are far greater than, than, than you may think, uh, because in international courts, for example, uh, you know, Venezuela has lost the, uh, the or, or is Venezuela is struggling to not lose the right, for example, to, to access its funds. Uh, Venezuela has lost control right now of uh, it's an oil company that is uh, it's a very large oil company that is in the United States. So it was the that was property of the Venezuelan state, and now uh, is being managed by a group appointed by by this man Juan Guaido, uh, and basically none of the revenue coming uh, from the country from from the company that usually uh, uh, used to come to the to Venezuela and and 
and not only the revenue, but also, like you said, the, the, the components to dilute the heavy crude and, and make uh, gasoline for internal use and all these things. Well, all of this basically stopped because Guaido uh, gained control uh, uh, illegally of uh, the company. Now, the people of Venezuela, uh, you know, I think there was a, there was a sharp jump in consciousness uh, during the last uh, 20 years or so because of, I think that the revolution here has been uh, a process where people have become more involved in politics, have become more aware of their surroundings, have, you know, have, have been encouraged to, to read and participate in politics. And, and basically, there's a transformed society. So when, when these things uh, begin happening, uh, even those that are on the opposition, well, they know, they, they, they acknowledge, they realize that you have Juan Guaido and other people, uh, you know, basically promoting these sanctions against the country and they resent them. So what you have, what you had was, you know, basically the opposite reaction that the United States wanted because they believed that, you know, these, uh, these sanctions and the effect of these sanctions would make people basically turn against the government. When in fact you have people from the opposition, well, they haven't turned in favor of the government necessarily, but they have been definitely in a, 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 against the leadership of the opposition. Why though today is far less, uh, you know, uh, uh, respected within his own ranks, within his own base, uh, than he was uh, three years ago when this whole adventure started. So basically, you have you know people that understand that. Uh, even if they don't like uh, President Maduro, or if they don't like uh, socialism, or whichever way uh, you know the country's going, they understand who the enemy is. They understand that the United States is trying to do this to cause pain in Venezuelan people, and they resent the people of Venezuela that have sort of uh, played into this game and have you know has tried to uh, promote these uh, sanctions against the country. Sorry there. That's, I mean, that's incredible. I, I'm sure that that opposition was to, you know, a, a force at some point, but for people to even be able to say, you know, I don't agree with this government, but I also don't agree with the U S is playing it. Even when the U S is actually in support of their opposition in a sense, I think that sort of transformation is uh, really inspiring because often it's people within the country that don't like that leader, that don't like that government or that want to be in power that become the tools of the West. And if it wasn't for that, uh, the country would be more united. Now, there's a reason I don't want to go too much into uh, the internal politics of Venezuela. First of all, I don't know enough. But second, I just think the larger, more interesting issue is these the super powerful imperialist arm with this mainstream media that we thought were like journalists doing their job trying to you know make the world a better place and when you realize you know ma mainstream media here and, and much of the west is literally government arm when it comes to foreign reporting um i think that is the uh the the newer thing now i i read that by you know someone said by most metrics hyperinflation ended in december 2021 how has the economy gotten better and what is it that the government has been to um, has been able to implement or push back against that has gotten the economy a little bit more back on its feet well different things have been going on and and for example one of the things we had to do was create a special law that would basically help us uh um you know uh, find ways of of uh, sending oil to other countries that you know not, are not as conventional as they used to be or you know financing uh uh investments uh, uh in a way that you know people that we can guarantee that people would not get uh uh hurt uh, uh by the u.s sanctions if they do business with venezuela so you know we have been able to to pick up uh production and, and oil I mean, oil production you you have to understand also that you know the the severity of the sanctions include the fact that not only we can get raw materials like you mentioned, but we also, you know, it also hurts uh, the maintenance of some of these uh, services and some of these uh, elements for our production. And for example, uh, and, and, and this is also a way in which they play in, against uh, people's everyday lives. Uh, you know, the electric, uh, the, the electric grid, for example, electric uh, system, um, 
it can easily you know shut down because we can't do maintenance on some of the uh equipment because the companies that are u.s companies that the first came here to uh you know to place the equipment well they they now can't come to venezuela and do business with us so they can't do maintenance uh and we can get you know spare parts repair uh water pumps so sometimes the you know the water supply of the cities are it gets affected uh we can even get you know supplies to for, for trucks to collect garbage I mean that's that's how that's how severe the situation is for people's everyday life. Uh, so you know, but but so, so so that helps raise the consciousness that you have to do an extra effort and you have to want find creative ways and things such as you know uh, our own local food production. Uh, you know where you you've had to actually grow things uh, in a in a in a cleaner way in a more uh, because you can't buy the fertilizers from outside. So now you you've turned to community gardens and, and and you know to community experiences of growing food and growing food internally. Where, when before we used to import a lot of these uh, this food, well that has turned you know uh, that has set some of the wheels around. And now you know we've been able to uh, pu uh, produce some of the food uh, that that we now consume. Uh, you have also had uh, workers, uh, you know. Uh, begin to organize themselves and and find creative ideas of how to replace spare parts that you can get from outside, how to join with workers in other uh, companies that before everybody was sort of you know export oriented, but now uh, you know given that we can't export them, we have to figure a way how do we do commerce within ourselves and how do we how do workers from one plant to another uh, you know find ways to complement their work and and begin and, and we. Re, re, you know, rekindle production that was uh, shut down because of the sanctions. So uh, a combination of all these things, basically, uh, uh, but mostly, you know, the, of the resistance of the Venezuelan people, the willingness not to be uh, put down because of these sanctions is what has led us to uh, improve uh, the economic situation. And then we're, we're still far from uh, when where we used to be, you know, five, six years ago. Um, and, and, you know, we could definitely be much better if these measures were in place, but, uh, but we're not down like we were two, three years ago. You know, we, we're, we're, we're seeing an economic recovery. We're seeing an important, uh, you know, we, we've learned to live with these sanctions and we've learned to uh, move forward. And hopefully, uh, as time goes by, we'll, we can prove to, to uh, U.S. aggression that, you know, we were able to resist and we were able to... Uh, uh, you know, go to to a next level of uh, production of, of, of improving the Venezuelan economy. Yeah, it's it's such a sacrifice, right? I mean, like I said, Ethiopia is pretty young on its journey, and it's just it, it, the, the U.S. is it stopping? It's trying to move forward with new sanctions. It took the country off of this trade deal that, to our point, only affects the people, does nothing to the leaders, except that it makes people uh, in their struggle start to get very, they they just want to live. They almost don't care who's the leader, right? So at times that can, I think, really be a problem, um, which we're seeing a little bit of that in, in Ethiopia as well. I'm interested in talking about allies because you need them, right? In this, when you're pushing back against something so powerful as imperialism, particularly US imperialism and Western imperialism, you need allies. So there is this a uh, group that was started that was, it's a long name, Group of Friends uh, in Defense of the Charter of the UN. It was launched in 2021. Venezuela is one of the at least 16 member states. And from what I understand, the, the goal of that group is to say, let's go back to what the UN Charter was actually created to do. It's not created to sanction countries unilateral. It's, it's not created to uh, isolate countries that want to be in charge of their own uh, politics. Talk, talk about allies and the, the significance of the uh, formation of that group. Well, several things. Uh, I was uh, I would first say about the the allies in particular. I have to I have to mention because of the pandemic uh, that we were uh, greatly supported by our friends in Cuba uh, who came here to Venezuela with a medical brigade to help you know uh, uh, deal with with the situation. But our friends in 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 Russia, China, 
Iran, uh, Turkey, India, who, who basically, you know, helped us with the supplies, uh, uh, you know, to, to combat. So, so I, th I think there is a sense of solidarity in, uh, in, in the world that, that it is very important and that, you know, if you build those uh, relationships uh, of cooperation uh, uh, with, with other countries, you know, you, you, can, you can depend on that uh, moving forward. But like you said, this is this group in particular, this group of friends of the of the UN Charter, is a very important group. Given that uh, what we see today is, uh, you know, as uh, the world moves forward, there's an attempt by the United States and and by some of its allies to sort of, you know, uh, skip the you know the international law, skip the consensus that 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 we established, you know, over the last uh, half a century or so. Uh, and basically, you know, uh, just act multi uh, unilaterally and do whatever they want to do. Uh, you know, you see this also militarily w w with NATO uh, and, and the way you know they use NATO as, a, as a, basically as a court uh, and, and as a and it decides uh, uh, to keep peace uh, in its in, in the way it, it, it only knows how to do so, which is through war. Uh, you know that's not that's not internet that's not what the international community is about that's not what international relations is about when you know we're about peace we're about uh, uh, you know that the UN Charter that guarantees rights you know the UN Charter that says that you cannot coerce another country into doing something uh, that, that that just because you don't like it or just because you know you, you feel like it has to go your way you know there, there's, there's some safeguards that were established by the whole international community in 1945 when when the UN was established and what uh, these set of countries that that, that you mentioned now, uh, where China's a part of it, with Russia's a part of it, with you know there's so, so other countries that are part of it, Venezuela, Cuba, Iran, and so forth. Uh, you know, it's it's important that these countries have have you know come together and said, look, you know, we're not. This is not an uh, an organization. Or this is not a group of countries that are that are basically uh, uh, aimed at, uh, against any other country. But we are defending the principles of the UN. We are defending the principle of international law we want to make sure that you know we abide by, by this commitment that all countries have made and that we don't basically throw away uh, you know uh, the work of the international organizations by everybody doing whatever they want and everybody doing uh, you know uh, uh, taking arbitrary measures that violate this commitment that you know that we first came to i think it's important because it, it, it makes you see that uh, most of the world recognizes that uh, these unilateral measures are are an attack or an aggression on on country sovereignties or an aggression on people uh, and their livelihoods, and that you know we should go back to you know uh, the international law, international commitment to diplomacy, to basically sort our problems and not to this type of aggression. Again, it's, it is very important that we understand and that everyone. Uh, uh, you know that that seizes understands that sanctions are another type of warfare they they may not be as violent and as bloody as you picture that when you have you know uh, uh, bombs coming in or missiles coming in but at the end of the day you have victims you have people that cannot get to hospitals on time because you know they don't have the supplies or because they don't have the gasoline to get there you have people that are that are suffering in in their uh in the way they eat because they cannot get the right supplies you have all these other uh uh, uh you know uh, uh, things that people have to undergo because of the sanctions that are an attempt on, against human life so this is as bad as any type of war it's just so that it you know it's portrayed as something different and there the media has played a a, a terrible role because they they downplay the effect of the sanctions they they make it seem as if these are somehow uh kinder uh measures but at the end this is this is definitely an aggression that that hurts people the same way that you know a, a, a conventional combat could yeah i think that the narrative part is so huge i don't know that uh the us the west would not would be able to get away with as much as it does if they didn't build a certain narrative around it, just so that people know some of the countries that are in that group of friends in defense of the Charter of the UN, it's Algeria, Angola, Eritrea is already on there. We know they're very resistant to imperialism and have been for the last 
uh, 30 years or so, China, Russia, some of the bigger ones, as well as the what's called the UN Observer State of uh, Palestine. I think this is absolutely historic. I mean, it is historic, right? It is, it is sort of saying what so many people that have been observing have known to be true in terms of this is not how it's done. That's not the point of the UN. Why is the UN being implicated in fueling wars? And in the case of Ethiopia, there have been seven UN officials that were expelled and some recordings came out from UN whistleblowers saying that some of them were working with the armed insurgent group that's in the North that has been fighting the country and its people uh, for the last year plus. UN officials, that's not, the average person does not think that's even possible. It sounds like a uh, conspiracy theory. And I just really commend um, the formation of this group because it's kind of stamping what, uh, what the UN is supposed to uh, stand for. What has, uh, the, not the sort of the opposition in the country, but the diaspora always plays a part for better and for worse. What have has been the role of Venezuelans in the diaspora, both from your perspective, good and bad? Well, it's been a complicated issue because first of all, we didn't have a culture of having many Venezuelans abroad uh, because, you know, especially, you know, in the last, uh, you know, uh, the, the, or maybe the you know the first twenty the, the the first ten years of the revolution, when we were you know achieving a lot of improvements that have been um, that have come under attack because of the sanctions, uh, you know the, the there was high levels of stability that you know didn't really uh, um, promote uh, migration. Uh, that obviously has changed in the last uh, couple of years, not to the extent that the mainstream media uh, you know uh, portrays. You know there's there's a there's an intentionality in portraying Venezuela as a, you know, some sort of a refugee crisis. First of all, there are no refugees because nobody's being persecuted, you know, in order to leave uh, uh, the country. There's a lot of economic migration. Yes, you know, it has increased because of, you know, the, the sanctions that we talked about. Nobody really talks about that, though. Every, you know, the mainstream media is basically just oriented at, at attacking Venezuela and saying that, you know, this is a crisis that Venezuela is somehow fueling. Uh, when it's in fact the you know the, the measures from from outside uh, that that take place, a lot of people have also I I believe uh, have left uh, under some uh, you know misguided uh, uh, a lot of people have encountered uh, uh, you know uh, very terrible situations. People have you know have been tricked into. Uh, almost uh, slavery type of uh, working conditions when they reach other countries. Um, so there's there's been a lot of uh, um, you know people that 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 have actually asked uh, to come back, and that the government has helped uh, you know provide a safe way back uh, to Venezuela because of this you know uh, misjudged uh, or, or, or you know different uh, expectations uh, once they get there. Of course, uh, there are some Venezuelans uh, that are in the opposition that have always been in the opposition in the United States. You could clearly see that. Uh, of course, there's political affinity to to the right wing, to conservative principles, and there were the you know the first wave, uh, so to speak, of uh, migration was uh, early during the the Venezuelan Revolution, where people um, went to places like Florida or, or in the United States or maybe in Spain. Uh, these are people that that you know were very, I mean, they had resources to migrate. Uh, they were you know upper middle class uh, uh, migrants, and that they have you know uh, they have always been active in the opposition against uh, the Venezuelan government for political reasons. There's a lot of people that have left that you know that even uh, participated here in some acts of corruption and left with some of you know uh, public money in their pockets and now they claim to be victims of uh of the persecution just because you know they, they left here when they were put on trial um so so this is so, so so you sort of see this uh message uh outside um and, and it's a mixed message you have people trying to come back in in, in one hand and, and because some of the tough experiences they they've, they've gone through and they, they believe that they have hope in, in Venezuela and they see that, you know, things are improving in Venezuela that they can come back and and test, uh, you know, their, their luck again or in here, so to speak. 
and then you have uh, people from from you know the traditional conservative uh, sectors uh, in in Venezuela, the same way you see uh, in in other parts of Latin America, like in Cuba or or Nicaragua, that they're you know they're the right wing conservative sectors moved to Miami, made the living there, and then they want to uh, and they basically promote an anti-Venezuelan campaign that they would actually even support these uh, measures and these sanctions against the country. Um, you know, for some of these people that are already dual citizenship, that, that have dual citizenship and that they can participate in U.S. politics, um, you know, they're not really concerned about solving matters in Venezuela, but they're concerned about having a political life and a political platform in the United States. And very much like uh, the Cuban diaspora, you know, uh, a few years ago, they want to become, you know, a, a, a political force within the United States. They have occupied very important positions within the Democratic Party and the Republican Party, uh, uh, and, and basically, and they base, you know, everything on how they are somehow, uh, you know, uh, fleeing Venezuela or that they're, you know, they're somehow persecuted by uh, a left-wing government. When in fact, this, you know, there's nothing. There's no persecution. There's really, you know, their intent of becoming a political force within the United States. So that's why you'll you'll get some some of the mixed uh, messages. But most importantly, I think is you know uh, the 30 million Venezuelans that have you know that that struggle every day here to build, uh, you know, uh, to 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 move beyond uh, these sanctions and and to build a, a steady economy, to build a better country, and and to you know trying to move forward and 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 have their future uh be a better future here in venezuela that's interesting i think the the uh the story of juan guaido is really interesting i believe he was the president of the parliament or maybe still is but in 2019 he declared himself the president and stuck with it uh with the support of the united states uh, Colombia, Brazil, and uh, one at least one other country, Chile. Um, and he just, people didn't, a lot of people didn't seem to know him. He declared, at the time anyway, uh, he declared himself the president. And for two years, uh, he was fighting to be able to actually claim that um, officially. Has that effort stopped? Has, or, or what, what is where are where, where do things stand in terms of the opposition now that uh, the last election has happened? Well, you see, in 2019, he was a member of uh, of the National Assembly. He had been elected as uh, president of the National Assembly, and then therefore that's why you know he he uh, he decides to proclaim himself president of the country. Now, uh, by now, you know that the you know the mandate of that assembly has expired. There were new elections. Uh, last year to renew the assembly. He's not even a member of the National Assembly anymore. But the United States keeps maintaining this crazy, uh, you know, uh, recognition on him and, and decided that, you know, they will still recognize him as a uh, member of the assembly and of, as uh, interim president with no end in sight, you know, so, you know, so much for democracy and elections and all that when you, you know, you basically choose somebody to, to be the, the eternal president until you feel like it. Uh, so, you know, that continues to be the case, but, you know, you mentioned a few countries that recognized them at the beginning, you know, they, they, there was a point where U S pressure made, uh, you know, about 50 countries or so, uh, recognize, uh, why though, no, of course, you know, there's, there's more than 190 countries in the world. So, you know, the fact that only, you know, 50 recognize them is, is not a big number, but even even after that you know today if you count the countries that continue to recognize Guaido as president you won't get uh you won't reach uh, you know uh, uh, 15 countries so uh this support has has eroded he has lost support in venezuela he has lost support uh outside of venezuela with the international community but there's no other way out for the united states in the sense that they have no they they have no uh choice other than uh you know accept uh, uh some sort of election where there's a high possibility that revolutionary forces that you know chavism will continue to be uh in power and they don't want to accept that so they're still trying to find ways 
to subvert uh, Venezuelan democracy and to, to say, well, claim that, well, you know, the, the elections, uh, the elections were not credible or the elections need observers that that we place there. Or, you know, there these kind of arguments. Uh, and it's and it's funny because they contradict themselves. You know, for example, we had uh, governors uh, were elected in November of last year. And basically, you know, uh, at the beginning, the first reaction of the United States, well, we don't recognize these elections. These are not credible elections. Then uh, when one of the elections, one of the key elections was uh, actually won by somebody, the opposition, then they congratulated, you know, the opposition for winning. So you're like, wait, wait, didn't you say you didn't recognize the elections? Now you do. So you basically only recognize elections when you win, but when you don't. I mean, it's like kids game. Uh, you know, and, and it would be funny if it wasn't so terrible, uh, you know, for, for what it means to, to Venezuelan stability and to Venezuelan democracy. But, um, but basically they're stuck and that's, that's the problem. They're stuck with a, um, supporting a leadership that they don't, uh, that they know, uh, you know, it's eroding and they know it's, it's, it's not going anywhere, but they don't have any other alternatives. They've, they've even, you know, uh, shut down a whole set of, of uh, members of the Venezuelan opposition who decided to participate in the election. See, there's a part of the opposition here that has said, you know, um, we don't support this idea of Guaido because, you know, we know, you know, somebody else was elected president. And we don't support the idea that you have to, you know, issue sanctions against Venezuela. So we're not in support of Maduro, but we, you know, you know but we also don't support intervention against Venezuela. That part of the opposition, which got about the same, you know, the same amount of votes as, as the Guaido sector of the opposition during the last elections, well, they've been basically shut out by the United States. They've been called, uh, you know, collaborationists. They've been called, you know, all these type of names. And, you know, I'm sure many of them do not see themselves neither as socialists or as Maduro supporters or anything of the sort. But they're being shut down because, you know, the, there's a certain group in the United States that wants to maintain this idea of Guaido being, you know, their man and Guaido being uh, the president. Uh, at the end of the day, I think, uh, you, know, uh, you know, we continue moving forward with our daily lives. And, you know, we will have presidential elections once again in 2024 and, you know, when, when, when the next elections are. And I'm sure the opposition will come up with different candidates and, you know, uh, you know, if uh, and so so you know, we also have our, our candidate will be the president or or however that's uh, decided at that time. In any case, we all bet on our democracy and our democratic process, and the United States is the one that's going to be basically left out uh, because they you know all they do is basically interfere with that democratic process. Yeah, I think it's kind of dark comedy but laughable nonetheless that they don't uh they don't see how they're contradicting each other and they don't they're not trying that hard which is really interesting i don't know if it was always this way um in terms of not trying that hard to to be consistent or if it's uh, and that social media is making it possible for us to see wait they recognize that person over there but why not over here whereas before maybe we'd be more isolated um there is a this is sort of from the Ethiopian and Eritrean in the horn perspective. Uh, Eritrea has been very resistant to imperialism for a very long time. So the people are broadly speaking on the same uh, page. Ethiopia is first a much bigger country. We're talking about 110 million versus a, a possibly a few million or so. Um, and there's always this sense, oh, no, we're going to give in. We're going to give in to the U.S. The prime minister is now talking to Biden. What's going on? Is he going to sell the country? So far, no indications that's the case. But is there a, was was Venezuela just completely like we're not compromising, or were, was there even space to compromise in a way that still prioritizes the people and the independence of the country in terms of uh, negotiating with the U.S.? Well, see, the issue here is that Venezuela has always been open to dialogue. And Venezuela, for example, there's there's, there's been ongoing dialogue uh, with the opposition, even with Guaido's uh, segment of the opposition, uh, you know, for for many years now. They, you know, they they leave the table whenever they feel that you know things are not going their way, or whenever they get a call from the State Department and says, you know, get leave the table because, you know, we can't negotiate that. 
Um, so, you know, it's not us basically that are, you know, uh, against uh, dialogue. Uh, you know, as a matter of fact, that, that there was a process, an ongoing process in Mexico where there were, you know, a group of the opposition was sitting there that, that represented Guaido and, 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 and basically by representing Guaido, you, you understand that they represent U.S. interests more than anything. Uh, and then the government was was there at the negotiating table, and that's when uh, you know the the this uh, kidnapping of of uh, the diplomat Alex Sapp took place. Uh, he was he had been uh, um, basically named as part of the negotiating table in a way to to protect him as well, and 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 and, and you know and and because he he also you know was important was was a key player to talk about. Uh, you know, the humanitarian aspects that, that were going to be discussed at the negotiating table. And the United States just basically decided that, you know, they didn't care and they, they were going to, you know, take him in, into their custody. And basically, you know, the reaction by the government, well, if there's no trust uh, for us to, you know, to to continue uh, talking, then we might as well just, just uh, wait till there are better conditions. And that's what we're waiting for right now, better conditions, and, you know, of trust and, and that we can move forward. But again, it is always after an aggression by the United States that, that these things stop. We are all, we have always been open to, to communicating and, you know, we don't have formal uh, uh, control of our embassy against, again, you know, against international law, against in violation of the Vienna convention, they took over the embassy and, and, and they gave it to white those people. And, you know, and because of that, we can help a lot of the Venezuelans that are living abroad. We can get them, you know, to have a, uh, even their identity papers or passports. You know, and none of that can happen normally because, uh, uh, you know, they have no functioning embassies. Um, you know, I, despite all these aggressions, you know, we, are, we have always been open to find a way of, of you know, communicating and, and reestablishing uh, uh, diplomacy, but but for us to establish diplomacy and relations, and all this, we need respect. You know that that's what we we demand. I mean, countries can only uh, have real relationships if they're doing it on a you know on the same level, and and if they do with respect to one another. Uh, otherwise, you know we're we're not going to accept an imposition of the United States on Venezuela, and. Perhaps you know that the easy way would be to basically do what the U.S. wants and 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 sort of give in, but you know we didn't fight an independence struggle 200 years ago so that you know we would do what other people want us to do. You know we have we have dignity, we have uh, we ask for respect, and basically that's that's where we stand. Uh, we're willing to have relations with anybody around the world, any country around the world, as long as they're relationships of mutual respect. Otherwise, you know we'll stand our ground. Yeah, it's really impressive. It seems like um, just sort of looking big picture that there is a shift world in the world order in a sense in that uh, the U.S. isn't able to get away with the things that used to get away with. The disturbing part of that is there's no evolution on their part in terms of approach. It just seems like we're so used to getting what we want and all of what we want. If it's not that, we're not going to negotiate, but it's not working. So my question to you, at least in a lot of countries, uh, is there is there a shift, do you think, right now in, in the last decade or so, and particularly in the last few years, there just seems to be a lot more countries that are pushing back successfully, even if it cost their people the world has changed um we definitely live in a world that is different now than it was 10 years ago 15 years ago um you know i think after 1989 there was this uh, terrible idea sold to the world that basically there was you know the end of history as fukuyama said you know the end of ideology so therefore we're all going to submit to this one uh model of democracy and of uh uh, of economy and and basically we're all going to be the same thing. Um, the the truth is that you know uh, history didn't stop, ideology didn't stop, uh, and you have uh, and, and and that formula for development that was the neoliberal model is basically a model that has only uh, aggravated uh, inequality throughout the world. So what you see many places around the world is a resistance to that. Uh, you know, we, we, we went through uh, a series, we've been through a series of uh, progressive governments here in Latin America, uh, 
trying to basically overcome that inequality and, and basically telling, you know, the United States and, you know, that model didn't work. That model doesn't work for us. That's not the model we want. And then you have other countries, you know, such as China, for example, ha that has done uh, a tremendous job in, in, in their own way and with their own uh, particular uh, set of, uh, of, of policies that has, you know, lifted millions of people out of poverty. And, and you know, and, and it's basically, so basically the, the world is showing the United States and everywhere else that, and everyone else that, you know, uh, there are other possibilities. Uh, you know, there isn't just one model. Uh, there isn't just one way of doing things. And I think that that sort of uh, makes, uh, you know, the elite of the United States, the people that control power, uh, sort of you know, come into uh, some, some type of panic now uh, because it seems that U.S. dominance is eroding because all these other poles of resistance are coming out in different parts of the world. You have a different Russia today that you had, you know, back, back in, in, you know, when the fall of the USSR. You have China now, you have, you know, other countries throughout the world with stronger economies than they've been before. So, you know, uh, basically the United States feels, you know, that, that it's losing that power and kind of enters into a, uh, a crisis mode and, and wants to, you know, uh, regain what is lost and wants to regain control of Latin America because it, it, it sees it as uh, its property. You know, before we used to say the backyard, now Biden, Biden came up a couple of weeks ago and said, no, you know, we, we respect Latin America. It's not a backyard. We see it as our front yard. You know, <laughs> they, don't, they have, it's amazing how, how they can say these things and not even realize what they're saying. Uh, but no, it's, it's true. I mean, there's, there's an obsession within the United States that they think that they, they actually own parts of the world. Um, so, you know, the, what's going to be the end result There's going to be a, you know, a lot of frustration because the world is going to go its own path. And, and I think also it's important that a lot of people within the United States are also realizing that, uh, you know, this is not the right way to go. And I think, you know, as time goes by, you have stronger progressive movements, uh, you know, that are also demanding uh, important uh, things in the United States. And, you know, they're demanding a, a, an end to the, that institutional uh, racism that you see in the police and departments and that you see, you know, throughout the country, you know, they're, they're, they're demanding, you know, a fight to end po to really end poverty. I mean, you have about 140 million people within the United States that are, you know, close to uh, uh, levels of poverty when it's supposed to be the largest and, and most pro prosperous economy in the world. And you don't see that if you, you know, you see Jeff Bezos going out to space and, 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 and thanking his Amazon workers for the trip they gave him. Uh, but, you know, you, you do see it in, every, in people's everyday lives and, the, and then they're trying to uh, change uh, the United States. So I think the United States is also going to go, you know, going to undergo uh, definitely changes in the coming years as the world turns into something different. As the world demands respect for international law, as the world demands, you know, acknowledgement that, you know, there are other models and other possibilities of livelihood. And as the people in the United States also begin to, to demand their rights, uh, you know, the full rights. Yeah, there's, there's certainly a lot of people here. I, I got to give credit to uh, institutions or organizations like Answer Coalition, Black Alliance for mm -hmm. Peace, and a whole bunch of anti-war, anti-imperialist uh, groups. So it, there's certainly a knowledge base here. It's just, uh, I'm curious when the average American is going to start connecting some of these dots, mm -hmm. but that's the point uh, of these kind of conversations. Carlos, thank you so much for your time. I really appreciate you sitting here with us. A lot of the audience, they're probably hearing uh, about Venezuela for the first time in, in, in length. So thank you, Carlos Ron, Venezuela's Deputy Minister of Foreign Affairs for North America and President of the Simone Bolivar Institute. Thank you so much, everybody, uh, for thank tuning you. in. We'll see you next time.